so yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Danica. And thanks everyone for coming tonight. It's a real honor and privilege to be with you. And tonight we can thumb our noses at this stupid pandemic and go somewhere. And we're going to go to the Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan. And I'm going to talk about Bhutan as being a stronghold for primate conservation. So my name is Lori Sheeran and I'm a faculty member at Central in the Department of Anthropology and Museum Studies and also in the Primate Behavior and Ecology Program. And I'd like to start off by just having us contemplate this flag here on the screen. This is the national flag of Bhutan. And flag, uh, Bhutan is also known as the land of the thunder dragon because when it thunders in this mountainous country, it just rolls through the valleys and across the mountains. And it's thought to be the voice of dragons. So you see the, that the dragon is very prominently displayed on the flag. His color is white to symbolize purity. And he holds in his claws these jewels that represent the wealth of the country. The yellow color on the flag represents the power of the King of Bhutan, who's the secular head of the government. And the orange on the flag represents the Buddhist traditions and Buddhist philosophy that's the underpinning of Bhutanese culture. So a lot of what I'll talk about tonight actually is embodied in the flag of the country. Um, let me first show you where Bhutan is situated geographically. And on this map, Bhutan is shown here kind of toward the center of the map. It's situated in the Himalaya bi biodiversity hotspot. So it's bordered by the countries of China and India. And tell you a little bit about what we mean by biodiversity hotspots. These are regions in the world that have tremendous diversity of plants and animals. The space itself though might be relatively small compared to other areas. And the idea behind identifying these biodiversity hotspots is that we can direct our conservation efforts toward, toward conserving these spaces. And if we do so successfully, we'll actually have saved a lot of the world's plants and animals. So here is Bhutan nestled right in the heart of the Himalaya biodiversity hotspot. And of course, this is a land of tremendous biodiversity. And it's rich in part because of an extreme altitudinal gradient that exists in the country. Um, elevations range from 25,000 feet, if you can imagine that, the glorious Himalayas, um, down to about 318 feet above sea level in the southern part of the country. And this all occurs in an area that's about four and a half times smaller than the state of Washington. So it's a really dramatic landscape and very beautiful to contemplate. Um, Bhutan has never been governed by an outside power. So for hundreds of years, the country was governed by a king and the royal family, but a process of democratization started to occur in the 1960s. And this culminated with Bhutan's first democratic election in 2008. So today Bhutan is classified as a constitutional monarchy and the king who is the gentleman pictured here is the head of the state and the royal family has tremendous moral authority. So here you see the current king and queen and their two children. And a really beautiful family, of course. The country is also um, characterized by really strong Buddhist beliefs and philosophy. Um, Buddhism is the state religion of Bhutan and Buddhists compromise, uh, comprise about 75% of the total population. And members of the royal family model Buddhist practices and this philosophy infuses their approach to governing their people. So from my perspective as an outsider to the culture, Buddhism is critical to the foundation of Bhutanese approaches to nature and to conservation. So for example, um, the local people believe that guardian deities live in the mountains and that these deities need to rest at certain times of the year. So during the periods between uh, sowing and harvesting of crops, the forest is, is closed to human activity. So people are barred from going into the forest to collect food or to collect fire, firewood. They can't take their herd animals into the forest. They're supposed to speak quietly. They're not supposed to burn things. 
So all of this is to show respect to the mountain deities um, and we want to avoid disturbing them during this time of rest. And of course, there's an ecological basis for these religious norms in that they help the forest to regenerate. So for hundreds of years, we've had these traditional forest management practices that promote the conservation of Bhutan's forests and the biodiversity of the country. And in 2017, Bhutan's total forest cover measured 71% of its land area. And many of these forests are intact. They've never been cut before. And they're linked by rivers, not by roads. In fact, Bhutan's constitution mandates that at least 60% of the country should always be under forest co cover for all time. And Bhutan is currently the world's only carbon negative country. So this map is showing you the national parks of Bhutan in the colored regions. So you can see that there's quite a few of these national parks and that they're large in size. Um, also important to note that there's these green corridors that connect these national parks. These are our biological corridors, they're forested regions, and they've been intentionally positioned so that there's connectivity between these forest patches. So animals like tigers, which are one of the species that you find in Bhutan, can travel from one park to the other without ever leaving the forest. So there's a great deal of foresight and wisdom that goes into the establishment of these parks and then ensuring that these are all connected to each other. This next map shows you in a more whimsical way um, some of the biodiversity of the country. Um, so this preservation of the forest means that you support a wide variety of very charismatic animals. I'll give you a second to just look at this map, but you'll, you'll be able to pick out animals like the great hornbill over here. Here's the tiger, which I hope I run into someday. Um, maybe not literally, but hopefully I'll see them someday. Elephant, there's monkeys that you see on the map, pandas and so on, red pandas and so on. The next few slides just show you some of my personal favorite mammals. Um, the animal pictured here is the takin. This is the national animal of Bhutan. Here we see a snow leopard. That's been captured on a camera trap. Looks like it knows exactly where the camera's at. And I love this picture. It's another camera trap picture, but this red panda looks like it's on a mission. So it's been captured as it moves um, through its habitat. So the spiritually grounded approach to stewardship and balance has become embodied and to some extent commodified in a concept that's called gross national happiness. This creates a context within which the environment is viewed as sustaining people's livelihood. So the environment's health is critical to the health and well-being of Bhutanese people. Gross national happiness is supported by um, so-called four pillars of governance that are pictured on this slide. So you see um, one pillar is sustainable and equitable socioeconomic development. One pillar is conservation of the environment. One pillar is preservation and promotion of culture. And one pillar is good governance. And the gentleman pictured here is the current prime minister of Bhutan. So all of these are viewed as foundational to gross national happiness. You can't have that health and well-being without the four of these being paid attention to, including their interrelationships. And a lot of the research that we're doing is going to center on the nexus between these two pillars. So the sustainable socioeconomic development, we want to improve the livelihood of people who live in Bhutan at the same time that we want to conserve the environment. And of course, there's going to be a bit of tension between these two pillars. Okay, so what about Bhutan's primates? I'm a primatologist, so I tend to focus on this subset of mammals. Bhutan is home to seven species of primates, and all of these species are present in the neighboring countries of China and India. But in those countries, these primates live in very small populations, 
They might be living in isolated forest fragments where there's little connectivity between forest patches and their numbers have been declining. We've been recording that decline for um, decades now. This is in contrast to what you see for Bhutan's primates, where again, you have these vast tracts of intact forest and there's connectivity between all of these forest patches. So quite a different situation for Bhutan's primates. And I'll introduce these seven species to you on three different slides. This first slide is showing you a group of monkeys that are called collectively macaques. And from left to right, you have the Assamese macaque pictured here. This is an adult male. The Manzala macaque, another adult male. This species was just recently discovered and described. And then on the far right here, you have an adult female and infant rhesus macaque. Macaques in Bhutan and elsewhere are famous for their ability to coexist with people. And they sometimes live near villages or in villages at temple sites, at tourist sites, near roads, in addition to living in the forest. And in some cases, they can become dependent on people's crops or on handouts from people as part of their diet. Their large body sizes, their high intelligence, and their dexterous hands make them really formidable with respect to deterring them from taking crops or from damaging people's home sites. So they're really quite impressive animals. Another group of primates that we find in Bhutan are called the langurs. And collectively, langurs are leaf-eating monkeys. So these are animals that tend to have a lot of leaves in their diet. In Bhutan, we have these three species of leaf-eating monkeys. We have the capped langur on the left, the central Himalayan langur in the center here, and the golden langur pictured here on the right. Like the macaques, these monkeys are also able to adapt to places where people live. And at some locations, you might find a species of macaque and a species of langur at the same site. For example, we worked at a farm site and interviewed a farmer where he had a group of macaques and a group of golden langurs living just at the end of his field, just at the end of his fence. And both of those types of monkeys had developed a strong taste for the fruit that he was growing. Last but not least in Bhutan, we have this adorable animal. This is the Bengal slow loris. This is uh, a primate. It's not a monkey, but it is a primate. And um, this animal lives in the southern part of Bhutan. We don't know very much about it yet because it's usually active at night. So those are our cast of characters. Most of the comments that I'll have going forward will focus on the golden langur pictured here and the Assamese macaque pictured here. So we'll talk mostly about those two species for the rest of my lecture. I'll, I'll pause for a second and see, uh, are there any questions or anything that I can answer before I move forward? Okay, if not, let me go on and, and talk a little bit about Bhutan as a stronghold for the conservation of these primate species. So what do we do at Central? What are we doing in Bhutan? Um, first of all, I'd like to emphasize that we have a partnership with Bhutanese people. And this was formalized in 2019 through a scientific delegation um, central faculty and staff were invited to Bhutan to engage in a, a, a signing of a memorandum of understanding. And you see pictured here the Dean of the College of the Sciences, Tim England, and his partner, Lisa. They traveled all the way to Bhutan and we signed this document. And basically it joins Central Washington University to the Yujin Wangchuk Institute for Conservation and Environment. Now that agency, which I'm going to call UWICER for the rest of my talk, is um, kind of similar to our Fish and Wildlife Service. So it's a group of experts, um, people who are really good at monitoring wildlife and measuring the health of their environment. And they're out every day collecting quite a lot of data. And through this memorandum of understanding that we have, 
we share the data that we collect with them and they share the data that they have with us. So it's a really wonderful partnership um, through which we can kind of leverage more knowledge about primate species than would occur if we work separate from each other. The research that we're doing in Bhutan kind of has two different foci right now. First of all, we're documenting the locations of Bhutan's primates and kind of getting a feel for how many individuals live at these different locations. And our goal with this process is to help map primates locations onto places where there's increased human activity. So these might be places where people are considering putting in dams or building roads or where there's quite a lot of tourist activity. Um, so basically we're looking for that type of relationship between the animal's distribution and human activities. The other thing that we can get out of this type of data is to find locations that will be really useful for future long-term study of primates. So the most profitable places to focus our research going forward. Um, so in, dis in mapping this distribution of primates, we are using cell phone technology and the UWI CER park staff who are out every day in the forest kind of monitoring what animals they see, what plants they see and what habitat conditions are occurring. We're asking them to use an app on their cell phone every time they see a primate. So the numbers in these dots are the number of times they've seen a group of primates at these locations. So you can see that at some spots like this spot right here, we actually have 38 separate sightings of that primate at that site. And so they take GPS coordinates for the sighting, and then they also enter into the app a picture of the animal so that we can later verify their identification of the animal. And then if they can, they also make a note of what the animal's doing. So here's just a few pictures that have been uploaded through this process. So you can see in this upper right corner, for example, an Assamese macaque group that's been sighted we have its GPS coordinates and then the observer entered in what the animals were eating and where they were in the canopy. Um, down here in the lower right, we have a golden langur that's sitting right next to the highway. In fact, it's on the barrier there um, at the edge of the road. And then here's a golden langur that's been sighted on a limestone cliff. Um, sometimes these monkeys will use the cliffs probably as a deterrent to predation. So it's not too uncommon to see them on these um, kind of inaccessible areas. So that's one of the projects that we're doing is to just kind of map out where the primates are at and to get a feel for how many of them there are. And again, how they might be affected by future development that's occurring in Bhutan. Our second research project is to focus in more detail on one species of primate in Bhutan. And the species that we chose to focus on first is the golden langur. So you might be wondering why we chose this animal. And maybe this slide here that shows you the golden langur, it will explain that. It's a ridiculously beautiful animal in my opinion. Um, so it's just a pleasure to spend time with it. But basically we chose this animal because it's the most endangered of Bhutan's primates. So uh, the World Conservation Union, an organization that brings together different conservation experts around the world, every two years publishes this document that's called Primates in Peril, the world's 25 most endangered primates. And for the last two biennia cycles, the golden langur has been one of these 25 primates. So the agency kind of focuses its attention on these very rare primates to attract conservation dollars and research attention toward them. And since golden langurs are part of that group, we decided they're a really appropriate animal for us to start our field research on. So the research that I'm gonna describe for you now is entirely the work of my master's advisee, Mr. Kunzang Dorji, who's pictured here in the field, langur hunting. 
Um, Kunzang is completing his master's thesis here at Central, and tomorrow, in fact, he defends his thesis. So if you'd like more details about this work, I invite all of you to attend his thesis defense that starts at five o'clock tomorrow, um, Pacific time. He generously shared some of this information with me, so I can pass this along to you too. So basically what Kunzong did was he chose a site where we have uh, golden langurs that live near a village and golden langurs that are located in one of those biological corridors. So remember that the biological corridors are tracts of forest that connect national parks. So biological corridors um, are relatively well buffered from anthropogenic impacts. They tend not to have roads through them, for example, while villages are quite lively places and monkeys are gonna encounter people pretty regularly at those sites. So what Kunzang wanted to do is to see how monkeys are faring in these two types of environments, especially as infrastructure changes to support improved livelihoods for villagers. So he looked at things like golden langur group sizes and compositions near villages versus in the biological corridor. And here we're looking for group structures that are suggestive of population growth. So we're looking for things like the presence of young or appropriate sex ratios. So here's a, a group of golden langurs that he sp spotted and you can see that there's a little baby right here. So he would count the numbers of adults and immatures in the group, for example. He also collected information on ecology. So things like what the monkeys are eating, how long they're spending at their different feeding sites, the presence or absence of predators. And again, the idea is to compare and contrast these pressures in village site versus in the biological corridor. And finally, what Kunzang wanted to do is to come up with an assessment of extirpation risks for each Langer group. Now extirpation is just a term that we use to um, kind of characterize the likelihood that a group might go extinct or a group might die out. So he's kind of assessing the mortality risks that a langur who lives near the village faces versus a langur that lives near the biological corridor faces. So here's some of Kunzang's data. Um, Basically, we have a map of his study area here, which is in central Bhutan. And the red points that you see are different groups of langurs that live near villages. So these are the ones that are probably seeing people on a daily basis. The blue points are groups of langurs that live in the biological corridor, and they're gonna be more buffered from human activity. The kinds of um, risks that he's going to assess include things like the risk of being hit by a car when langurs cross the road. And uh, sadly, Kunzang has some photographs of langurs that have been hit by cars. I chose not to, to show those to you, but you can see that because um, these roads kind of bisect the canopy where roads exist, the monkeys might come down to the ground and try to cross. And, Every road I've been on, at least in Bhutan, is extremely windy. It's a really mountainous region. So cars have very limited sight distance. So it's, it's difficult to see even an animal as big as a langur in the road. Um, another risk that he assessed are exposure to power lines. So when power lines are put into place, the monkeys quickly start using these as part of the canopy. And in some cases, these can be dangerous. There's a risk of electrocution if the insulation isn't properly installed and so on. So those are the kinds of things he would look for in the two landscapes. The data that he generated uh, looks something like this. This is looking at just one risk factor, which is predation. And again, we're kind of looking at Langer groups that are at farm locations, so these are near people, and Langer groups that are in the biological corridor, so are more remote from people. And if we look at the left side of the screen first, the dots that you see are different Langer groups. So these are all groups that live near farms. And as you get toward the redder color on this diagram, you're basically getting at higher risks 
of predation. So in Kunzong's data set, these two groups right here that live near farms face predation risks from leopards, from raptors, and also from domestic dogs. Um, here's the predation risk for Langer groups that are living in the biological corridor. So again, each of these points is a Langer group. As you get toward the red, you're getting toward higher risk of extirpation. And you can see that we have one group that's kind of of concern in this landscape compared to two or three over here. So Kunzang's goal was to kind of assess the quality of these two habitat types overall, but he also wanted really incisive information on which groups need protected. And we might have a, an insight into what we would like to do to mitigate these um, extirpation risks. So his entire data set looks something like this. So in the columns, again, he has different risk factors that he's assessing. So things like electrocution, roadkill. This column of retaliatory kill, he acquired through ethnographic interviews. He talked to farmers. And in cases where farmers' crops were really being heavily affected by monkeys, um, he tried to gauge how likely the farmers might be to um, try to kill the monkeys to, to put an end to that behavior. Habitat disturbance would be things like disturbance due to road installations, or alterations of the canopy, fuel wood, things like that. Group structure, so here again, we're looking at the composition of the groups and the numbers of adults and immatures, and then predation I talked about um, on the previous slide. So in the cell, we have the different Langer groups, and this row is the groups that are living near villages. This row is the groups that are living in the biological corridor. So you can see that we do have some groups we might be concerned about in the biological corridor, but we have many more groups that are of concern in the farm areas. And he could identify one particular group that was facing extirpation risks on a variety of fronts. So again, his goal was to be able to be pretty incisive about mitigation measures that we might make. And this also tells us where we might locate our education outreach programs um, that we might be doing in conjunction with UWI CER staff in this area. So that's the research that we're doing in collaboration with UWI CER staff. We're also engaged in collaborative teaching in Bhutan, and this is occurring through a Biodiversity of Bhutan field school that we're running there every year, at least if, if COVID allows, we're running it every year. So again, let me orient you toward the location of Bhutan. Here's the country of Bhutan bordered by China and India. And um, we have based our field school in this region right here, the Pabjika Valley, which is kind of in the central part of the country. And this valley is already famous to bird watchers because it's a nesting site for this fantastic creature here, the black-necked crane. This animal has an enormous migration range that spans China down into India, and it makes a stop in the central part of Bhutan. Um, so there's quite a lot of tourism that centers around observing this animal in its nesting grounds. And there's also a lot of uh, local economic development that's centered on that tourism. So we have a nature center that's in a national park that's in the Pajika Valley. And here we teach CWU and UWI CER students and we have staff that include CWU faculty and UWI CER um, staff or faculty. So this is our 2019 cohort of students. And if you look in this first row here, you'll see my colleague, Dr. Kathleen Barlow. She's a cultural anthropologist and she's one of the instructors of the field school. So each of us instructors has a module that we prepare and teach to the students that gives them a skill that they can use in their field work. So as a cultural anthropologist, Dr. Barlow taught ethnographic field techniques and she supervised that activity that the students engaged in. 
Um, this lady here in the center of the front row is a UWI CER faculty member. So she might teach a different kind of module that's focused on maybe butterflies or birds. So we had experts um, from different fields teach these modules. So here's our, one of our ethnographic methods teams. You can see the UWI CER staff members and the central student. And together, these students, um, after taking Dr. Barlow's uh, ethnographic methods module, they conducted an interview with this lady from the village who talked to us about her herding practices and what kinds of wildlife she encounters in the forest. We also learned ecological monitoring techniques. So here again is uh, Mr. Kunzang Dorji one of the UWI CER faculty, and he's teaching us how to use camera traps. Um, this is a, a very effective technique in Bhutan because of the thick forest, um, it's difficult to see a lot of elusive animals like tigers and some of the monkeys. So we learn about camera trap placement and how to use these to collect data. Another UWI CER staff member taught us a freshwater ecosystem module. And these are central students out um, collecting some samples and we're using this to assess the uh, cleanliness of the water and to monitor the biodiversity of the stream here. And then I taught a module on primate field methods. So I would teach the students things like how to identify monkeys, how to determine if they're male or female, adult or immature, um, how to collect behavioral data from the monkeys, and how to monitor what the monkeys are eating. Finally, we um, also have a module that's focusing on education and outreach. This is a group of school children adjacent, who live adjacent to the Nature Center, and they came to the Nature Center and stayed overnight a couple of nights. So during the day, we would take them to the forest and teach them about the different animals and plants that are present in the forest. And we would play games with them and sing songs. And so this is part of our educational outreach. Um, and we can assess the efficacy of that outreach through this program too. And of course we have time during our field school to experience the vibrant culture of Bhutan. So we visit a number of different museums. We go to different monastery sites. And in 2019, we ended our trip to Bhutan by a hike up to this monastery called the Tiger's Nest. It's about a three hour hike up. And on our way back down, after we toured this magnificent monastery, um, we encountered a group of Central Himalayan langurs. So I still vividly remember that as one of the best days of my life, just an amazing place. So in conclusion, um, here at Central, what we envision is a long-term partnership with UWI CER and with Bhutanese people um, through which together we'll work on different research projects, different educational projects, and conservation that focuses on the seven species of primates that are found in Bhutan. And I like to invite any of you who are interested to join us. Um, this link here takes you to the Bhutan Field School program page. Um, anyone is welcome to apply. Uh, if you need the link, please just email me. I'll be happy to tell you more about the program and to send you the specifics of how to apply to it. Um, we won't be running it in 2021 because of the COVID pandemic but we're expecting to be back online with it in 2022. And again, we plan to run it annually from that point onward. I'd like to acknowledge these different entities that have supported our research and these individuals who have been very instrumental in our research. And then uh, of course, last but not least, thank you all for your attention and for coming tonight. And I welcome your questions. Uh, can you hear me, please? I can. 
uh, i wanted to know uh, if you had any information on uh, interchange or exchange of uh, animals of uh, these endangered primates between india and bhutan uh, just for information i am karnal ashwin bindur a retired uh, amateur natural history uh, you know uh, i'm interested in that and i'm speaking from pune india welcome how exciting to talk to you thank you for being here um we know that the the golden langur for example ranges across that border that's shared with india so we have a, a lot of research actually, actually that's been done on golden langurs in india um if you look at satellite imagery of the forest cover it's really striking that when you cross the border into bhutan the forest is much more extensive and more intact so uwi cer staff tell me that their impression is that where possible um golden langurs and other primates are kind of going northward following the habitat that exists so heading up toward the forests of bhutan um from india uh thank you that's interesting it's good to know that at least that population has a, a fail safe for a forest that they can fall back on which is really not the case for so many endangered creatures in india yes thank you yes. so much you're welcome thank you for your question lori it looks like you have another one in the chat um that's asking do you think this model could be implemented in other places like south america or maybe even uh vietnam i i think it would be an amazing um program to implement in other places and i don't know why this was true for me maybe i'm particularly thick headed but it hadn't really occurred to me to try to collaborate with the forestry department before i had always partnered with universities in the past and I just kind of blindly sent an email to UWI CER staff and somehow that email worked its way to Kunzang Dorji's inbox and it's been a dream to collaborate with these um professionals because they have such a wealth of knowledge and so much data that they've already collected and are willing to share with us it's just um kind of amazing what we can do with it in a relatively short time so I think it would be great if other other places would like to model on this. And I think you have another one too. Can you tell me how long the field school is? Yes, it's about 3 weeks all together right now. Um it takes us a couple of days to get into Bhutan because there's um no direct flight from the US at least that takes you there. So we transit through Bangkok, we have an overnight in Bangkok and then we go into Bhutan. So we're in the field for about 10 days at the nature center and a, a wonderful feature of the nature center is that there's no internet connectivity there so you're completely off the grid for a few days and then the rest of the time we engage in our cultural excursions Dr. England just pointed out that it's about 250 yards from front to back. I'm assuming he's talking about the field school. <laughs> Could be. Sorry, I'm I'm scrolling through all of your wonderful faces. So apologies if I'm peering in an odd way. Does anyone else have any other questions about maybe even general primates? Oh, here's another one. Do you have plans for more observation in involving the slow lorises? I would love to spend some time with the slow lorises. Um yeah. So I'm hoping so that they are I guess they are found mostly near the border with India and that's an area where the Bhutanese government is not keen on foreigners being um very much so i think it would be kind of challenging for me to collect data down there but um certainly the uwi cer staff have been down there so i'm very interested in working with them uh, i have another question uh, can you hear me uh, uh, dr shiharjan i can 
uh, uh, do you have any uh, research in your institute going along with the gibbon species in india and uh, its neighboring regions gibbons are an animal near and dear to my heart i um, my phd dissertation focused on black gibbons in yunnan province in china so i spent about 15 years of my life studying gibbons in China and a little bit in Thailand. I have never been to India um, to my regret, but um, yeah, gibbons are, are an animal that I'm very interested in. Would you be associated in any way with the Skywalker gibbons? I, the, the site I was at was later taken up by that research team. So I haven't seen the Skywalker Gibbons, but I followed that team's research with great interest. That has, uh, you know, got a lot of interest in Gibbons in my, the children of my uh, uh, children's nature group. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's a great name. I can never think of good names, so. We have another question to ask, what language is spoken in Bhutan and do you include language lessons in field school? I'm very glad you asked that. I apologize, I forgot about that. One of the amazing things about working in Bhutan is that from a really early age, um, children learn English. So their signs are in English, everyone speaks English flawlessly, almost everything is written in English. So for us as uh, those of us who are only English speakers, adapt really readily to Bhutan. Um, so we learn a little bit of Dzongkha, which is the national language of Bhutan, um, you know, with respect to some polite phrases like hello and thank you and so on. Um, but mostly we can use English. Another question, are pets kept as, or sorry, are primates kept as pets in Bhutan? They don't seem to be. Um, I think this is partly because that isn't really a concept that's consistent with Buddhism. And again, I'm speaking as an outsider, so this might be an inaccurate observation, but kind of that idea of ownership doesn't really exist in Bhutan. And I was really impressed to learn that um, when I was in the capital city of Bhutan, I had a chance to visit the Takin Preserve, which is said to be the only zoo in the country. It exists because sometimes animals are injured and they need shelter during the time that they're recovering. But basically the king said, animals should not be kept in captivity. And where we hold them in captivity, they need to be in a landscape that's really natural. So this Takin Preserve is a really amazing zoo, if you will, and it's the only zoo in the country. So there really doesn't seem to be that idea of owning a wild animal um, in Bhutan. Great. And then one more question that I see, in what ways are we, or which ways are being considered to mitigate electrocutions? Yeah, so um, because we're working with UWI CER, we know where all those power lines are going in and the quality of them. And I guess the idea is to make sure that the juncture of those lines are sufficiently insulated, that there isn't a bare spot where a, a monkey's um, limb can, can come into contact with live wire. So it entails kind of changing the type of wiring that's used and the quality of it, and not necessarily changing the location of those wires. If anyone else wants to ask a question live, Is feel free to. Is poaching a threat in? Uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, my apologies, I. Uh, is poaching uh, any kind of threat in Bhutan? It is a threat. Um, I, I think more so in terms of farmers becoming frustrated. Uh, okay the rating of their crops and then retaliating against monkeys or trying to get rid of the monkeys in the area. Um, but with respect to poaching for the sale of primates or for uh, bushmeat, I don't think that's very common in Bhutan. Thank you. You're welcome.
What I'm dying to come see in India are the lion-tailed macaques, actually, Ashwan. Yes, uh, you're most welcome. And uh, we'd love to, uh, in the place where I live, of course, uh, I get to enjoy the uh, langur. I don't know which species now after the classification, but uh, they're there. And of course, the uh, uh, makaka mulata. <laughs> right. I have a question. Uh, going back to the power lines. So are they doing studies there or work there about like the natural canopy bridges or like the man-made bridges? Do they do that as like a remedy? They don't need them, which is so amazing to me. The forest is already connected really. Um, so even in places where you have roads, um, basically there's still a lot of intact forest that exists yeah. and the roads are constructed mindfully not to interrupt those biological corridors. So you still have a good deal of um, habitat connections there. Okay. But you're right, you know, for shorter crosses in the canopy, gaps in the canopy, um, I think it would be effective to put bridges in. Yeah. Put bridges. Yeah, even just like a rope crossing so that they use that instead of the, the power lines, is what I'm thinking. Yeah, and you know, an issue that I could see when I was there, and Dean England might want to talk about this a bit too, you often see monkeys along the roads, and this is because visitors to Bhutan enjoy feeding the monkeys. So the monkeys, I think they view the road as pretty easy to cross, even if there is trees that they could go across because they're already hanging out there waiting for handouts or sometimes they're licking the salt off the road that's been put down for ice. Um, so it's not too uncommon to see them sitting along the edges there, especially the Assamese macaques. And I would only jump in that when Lori described the, the roads there as being twisty, um, that's an understatement. I don't think that there are very many times you can see more than uh, 50 yards up the road before it goes around a corner on something. You're either constantly left or right or up or down. Gosh, it's wonderful. I'm looking at all of your names. That I really appreciate all of you who came, and it's so good to see so many people. Uh, I I'm here because of Sarah Langur lover on Twitter, and uh, so then I asked her what's the link, and she gave it. So while she herself isn't here, she is recording it. I'm told. But uh, I just happened to chance upon your talk. <laughs> I'm really glad you're here. Is there any more questions before we go ahead and let Dr. Sheeran go on with her night? Does anyone have anything to add for the good of the order? I love how many alumni are here, Lori to hear your talk too, that's great. I know, it's wonderful to see everyone. Be lots of past students that I recognize names, so that's awesome. Yes, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming, I really appreciate it. One one quick question. Thank you so much, Dr. Kieran, yourself. Oh, Dean, Dean England had a question. Just, uh, if anyone here was interested in uh, attending Kunzang's thesis defense tomorrow, what is uh, the URL for the Zoom meeting or the, the meeting ID? Or how can, how can they get that? Thank you for making that point. If, if you could email me, and my name is S-H-E-E-R-A-N-L at cwu.edu, I can send you the link. You get all the details, all the monkey business in his um, presentation. Awesome. And before I forget to, we have a link to a survey that just helps us 
after each of these presentations. So if you don't mind taking a minute to fill that out, that would be great. Okay, awesome. Thanks everyone, have a great Tuesday.